Welcome to Summit Drive Church. This is us right now, worshiping together through our online service. We are excited you're joining us today in worshiping our amazing God through song, prayer, and scripture. My name is Sharon, and I serve as a director of children's ministry here at Summit Drive Church. Again, we couldn't be happier that you've connected and are now participating along with us. For Life and Community, we have a few things for you to note. If you have any needs or know of anyone who does, we would love for you to connect with our office so we can help either financially or with practical help. Please connect with us if you know of a need that together we can meet. We are working through our gift book series called Lovers in a Dangerous Time. If you go to our website, it will pop right up. You can't miss it, and you can download it there. Would you please join me now as we worship through prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, we pray now for each and every person within our church community. Lord, we pray you put your hand on each person who is discouraged or lonely and bring them courage and hope instead. Give us all your joy, comfort, and hope in these times of uncertainty. Lord, as we journey together through this year's gift book, help us to incorporate all the habits we're learning, to carve the space in our hearts and minds for you, and to devote time daily to hear from you. Take away all fear and worry, and encourage us in knowing that you have every single thing under control. Every single thing. Thank you, Jesus. We pray now for those who need an extra touch of your love. Please comfort the Otter and Trichel family in the passing of Leo. Wrap your loving arms around them right now as we pray. We pray for Carol as she recovers from a broken hip and for Judy who is beginning chemo. Give them each an abiding sense of your presence. Be with the young father who is resting at home now and on medication. We pray, too, for a young man who has recently been diagnosed with leukemia. These are hard things, Lord, and we fully depend on you. Please be with Brian, Len, Lori, and Steve, who are each fighting cancer at this time. We also pray for a quick and speedy recovery for our friend, Bob Cran, as he recovers from recent surgery. God, we praise and thank you for George and Marjorie today. We praise you that they are doing so well. We pray with them that they continue in finding and seizing opportunities to make an impact for your namesake. May they share with others the encouragement that you give them at this time. We pray for Church on the Hill in Logan Lake, and we ask that you guide them still as they've recently moved through a pastoral transition. Lord, please be with Steve and Christiane and their children who have moved from the Yukon to lead and pastor them. We pray that they feel connected and at home in their new community. Thank you that they've followed your leading and remain faithful in your service. We also pray for Sun Sunshine Ridge Baptist Church in Surrey. Just pour your love and encouragement on them today. Help them to flourish right where you have put them. We also pray for our media and arts team here at Summit Drive. Please give them, uh, this team, a sense of renewed energy and passion for what they are doing for your glory. God, we thank you, or we think of our persecuted brothers and sisters in North Korea. We pray specifically for these North Korean prison camps and for believers pressured to deny their faith for the sake of their families. We pray for Christ's love to unite them in the midst of their pain. And we even pray you draw the guards towards treating those who are mistreated with compassion and kindness. Again, we pray for each and every valued person here today. May we be known for your love that we share in together. And may that love overflow in and outside of our community and into our city that we live in. Amen. I'm going to pass things over to the worship team. Thanks, Sharon. Well, welcome. Let me tell you, it has been a hectic morning here trying to get last week's service up and running for you guys. And, but I'm excited because today we are focusing in our worship service today on the, the theme of prayer. 
and the gift that prayer is. You know, it can be easy in our lives to just become so busy and so focused on other things that we forget to pray. Or maybe we think that because we've been so distracted that God doesn't really want us to communicate with him. Maybe you're even coming to worship today and you're feeling that God is disappointed in you or that he isn't really interested in hearing your prayers or your songs of worship today. But listen to these words from Psalm 103. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Because of Jesus Christ, we can know that that is true for us today. God wants you close today, and he wants to hear your voice, and he's made it possible for you and I to come right up to him, to receive his forgiveness no matter what, and to give him our thanks today. So let's do exactly that. Wherever we've come from this week, let's come to him, letting his grace wash over us, and let's remember his goodness and the great things that he has done, and let's lift our voices as our gift of praise to our wonderful Savior. Let's praise him together now. Wherever you are, let's join our voices and sing.
you free every captive and break every chain, oh God. You have done great things. We dance in your freedom.
voice that scatters fear. The great I am, the Lord is here. Who oh, praise the one who fights for me and shields my soul. Removed our 
transgressions from us. Thank you, Jesus, that that is true. We praise you. Thank you, worship team. What a delight it is to be able to praise God. And so, let me pray as we begin today. God, thank you that you have removed our transgressions from us. Thank you, Father, that we can boldly approach your throne because of what you have done for us. God, you are to be praised. And we pray that as as we hear from your word, as you speak, Lord, through me, that it would be your word that takes root in our hearts and everything else would fall flat. Pray this in your name. Amen. Well, hello. It is an honor to be able to share the word with you today. And today we're talking about, we're in our part three of our our gift book series called Lovers in a Dangerous Time, and we are looking at prayer. And uh, there's a lot we can say about prayer. Uh, the question that, something that popped in my head when I was reading a book, uh, Donald Whitney in his book, Spiritual Disciplines for the Christian Life, gives this really helpful story for us as we kind of dive in, talking about the various disciplines and healthy habits for faith formation. And here's the story. It goes like this. Imagine a six-year-old, Kevin, He's in music lessons, and he's learning to play the guitar. But when he gets home from school, his mother encourages him to practice his guitar, but he is just looking out the window, watching his friends play soccer, strumming along lifelessly. No direction, just drudgery. Now suppose Kevin is visited by an angel one afternoon during his guitar practice. The angel gives him a vision where he goes to Carnegie Hall and he sees this guitar expert giving a concert. Kevin is astonished. I mean, the musician's fingers effortlessly slide up and down the neck of the guitar. His fingers fluid and smooth, making beautiful melodies. Unlike Kevin, currently, who remembers his own hands faltering over the chords, stumbling around, clunky. Kevin's amazed. And the angel asks, what do you think, Kevin? Wow, is all that he can say. And the vision vanishes, and Kevin is alone with his guitar. And the angel says, Kevin, that wonderful musician is you in a few years. But you must practice. Now, what do you think happens to Kevin? Will his attitude to practicing change? Absolutely. His discipline is no longer drudgery. There's a direction. There's a goal pulling him into the future. Yes, it's going to take effort and intentionality, but it certainly isn't drudgery. See, Donald Whitney's story begins like this to show how so often uh, we approach the Christian life and really prayer without direction. That's for some, sometimes it can seem just like drudgery. But you've got to understand what God intends to make us, what God is doing in that. He's making us like Jesus and drawing us close to him so that we, we know, we really know God. And, and that's the direction that our times in prayer are taking us, nearer to the heart of God and into his presence. Now let me ask you another question. If you have one week left to live, what will you do? See, most of us will think of some family, maybe some people we'd like to see. Many of us think of some experiences that we really want to have. And, and truth be told, for many of us, The way we answer that question kind of tells us something about what we really want. It often tells us that we live as though this world is all there is. But we were made for more. For an eternal, life-giving relationship that we can have now and that will last forever. It will never end. Jesus says this. He says, now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. That's where I want to go with you today, to talk about prayer, but to see how our prayer life leads us to know God, that that is the direction that our life is going, and prayer is essential for it. We're not simply chasing experiences or 
fun things or simply pursuing what the world has to give us. But we want to know God himself here and now, growing close to him. And that has value for our life now and forever. See, the direction of our life, if we're followers of Jesus, is going toward communion with God our Father and living according to his will. And therefore, we are called to be a praying people. Now, for many people, I've heard the following laments. God feels so distant when I pray. I don't hear his voice, and I really don't know where to start in prayer. Why can't I seem to get an answer? And I think the most helpful place for us to start then is with the first few lines of what Jesus says when he is teaching us to pray. You can find it in Matthew 6, starting in verse 9. He says this, This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, if you've ever felt it challenging to pray or really don't know where to start praying, that's pretty normal. And and Jesus is actually saying these words to a crowd of people that have been praying their whole life. They pray like at least three times a day. That's how they've grown up. And yet Jesus is giving them and us a real prayable model. But let's pause for a moment on that first, those first two words. Our Father. This is remarkable. Jesus is appealing to God's fatherhood as the starting place and the source of comfort and trust that we have in him. He does this throughout the Sermon on the Mount. He says, you don't need to worry. You don't need public approval because God is our father. And father is such an intimate description. We are God's children. The holy, perfect creator and sustainer of the universe He's the one we're praying to, and he knows what we need, Jesus says, even before we ask. See, when we start by praying our Father, the reformer and theologian Martin Luther says that we're actually taking a moment to recall our situation, to recall who God is for us and who we are before him, and how wonderful it is that we've been taught to call God Father, to call upon him as Father, even though rightly God could demand and say, I'd like you to see me as judge. Right? What a great comfort there is to know that God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, wants us to rest and trust in his fatherly love. That's why we have to start here when we talk about prayer. If we miss it, we enter prayer with less intimacy, less wonder and love for our father. So what gives us the right to call God father? The Bible says this, yet to all who did receive him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to be called children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. So if we've received Christ as our Lord and Savior, and we've trusted in him for our salvation, then by the blood of Jesus Christ, because our sin has been washed away on account of Jesus' death and resurrection, We've been saved from sin and reconciled, made right with God. And it gets better. We've been adopted and welcomed into God's family. And we can cry, Abba, Father. We have an intimate connection to God when we've received by faith what God has offered us. So if you're a follower of Jesus Christ and you confess him as Lord and Savior of your life, and believe in your heart that he rose from the dead? Like, this is for you great and wonderful news. You are caught up in the arms of God, your Father, and his ear is always attentive to your cries. You know what this means? This means that God wants us to know, to really know his love for us, and how secure we are as members of his family. J.I. Packer, in his book, Knowing God, says that if God in love, has made Christians his children, then the family relationship must be an abiding one, lasting forever. Christians may act the prodigal, but God will not cease to act the prodigal's father. Second, God will go out of his way to make his children feel his love for them and know their privilege and security as members of his family. And that should present us with, you know, at least two comforting things. If we're God's, 
that when we sin, God's arms remain open. But we must come to him. And secondly, God has gone out of his way to make his children feel his love for them. And God does this in a variety of ways. He gives us his word, a testimony of his love for us, and to the relationship that he calls us into. His empowering presence, he promises, will be with us to the very end. He does this through his people, through us caring for one another. And he does this through providing for us in other subtle ways too. And this really gives us hope an awareness of God's love, and it leads us to holiness. And amazingly, God calls us to talk with him, to live before the face of God. And we can actually do that honestly and personally with our Father. This week, Pastor Dave mentioned that for most kids, they reserve their their worst behavior, their loudest laments, their big tears about that hard thing that happened at school for their parents. And the reason why? Well, it's because we're their safe person. And this is something we see in the Psalms. The Psalms, really, uh, Bonhoeffer calls it the prayer book of the Bible, are extremely honest. And the Psalms, particularly the Psalms of lament, which is like 40% of the Psalms, show us how we can approach our Father in reverence and honesty together. That He is God, that He's our Father, and we can actually come before him and pray our actual feelings, our disappointments, our anger, our frustra- frustration to him honestly. And that's like a soothing aloe rubbed across sunburnt skin. You know, it refreshes even though the burn of life lingers. And we know it will. The Psalms show us really how we can pray in the major and minor key, the good times and the bad times. But really it's the intimacy of our relationship with God that allows for this. And it's the reconciliation we have through the blood of Jesus Christ, shed for our sin on the cross, that makes this intimacy possible. See, the Psalms really really show us what this looks like in prayer. If you turn your Bibles to Psalm 13, we find a psalm of lament. I want to read it. Psalm 13 says, How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Honest questions. Look on me and answer, Lord my God. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. And my enemy will say I have overcome him. And my foes will rejoice when I fall. But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise, for he has been good to me. The psalmist is pouring out exactly what he feels to God. And you know, lament is an appropriate response to the evil that we see in our world. We don't have to hide that from God. We can pray in every key of life. And the psalms really show us how to be angry and sin not. They teach us to pray to God, to really pray. And all but one psalm, ends in praise. And you see it here in the midst of the lament there is but. But what? Stephen Dempster says praise properly understood roots us in reality. We see things as they are and in the right perspective and consequently we must praise God. So even in times of lament God is to be praised and his salvation is always there and his purposes are still going forward. Even in tough times What God wills, will be done. And that brings us to the next part of our prayer that I want to focus on. Praying for God's will to be done. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Sometimes when people are praying to know God's will, I hear things like this. I'm praying to know God's will, but he's just not answering me. I'm not getting anything out of my prayer time. I'm not getting what I want. I'm not hearing from God. You know, our starting place in our prayers, when we're praying for God's will, it has to be rooted in what God has spoken. He speaks to us with real, tangible, and consistent words. Right? When we're praying to know our future for guidance, for our everyday hopes and dreams, something I'll call God's unrevealed will, we do best to start with meditating on his revealed will. And that's the thing about prayer. God's revealed will, what he already wants for us to do and to be, can be found in his word. 
He speaks to us. And we do well to pray what God has already said. The Psalms, which we've discussed already, that give words to our lament, that show us how to really pray and express our deepest and inmost struggles to God, that root our reality and praise to our Father, they don't start with prayer. But with, as Eugene Peterson says of Psalm 1, as pre-prayer. Here's how Psalm 1 starts. It says, Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. And here's what Peterson says of that. He says, The text of the Psalms that teaches us to pray doesn't begin with prayer. We're not ready. We're wrapped up in ourselves. We're knocked around by the world. And Tim Keller reminds us that without immersion in God's words, our prayers may not merely be limited and shallow, but also untethered from reality. We may be responding not to the real God, but to what we wish God and life to be like. Right? This is how we'll learn the words to pray. Like babies, how do they learn to speak? Peterson says, because they live in a place that speaks and they speak things back, right? So we learn by being immersed and we must be immersed then in God's word as we pray. We've got to listen to what God has said to us and then to be coming in prayer to know him. If God is not the starting point of our prayer, then we are praying what we think our emotional needs are and those become the drivers and sole focus of our prayers. Tim Keller says, we begin to fashion God into the likeness that we want. This is why we need God's word. Like, we should not come to God in prayer based on the experiences and feelings that we want. We should do everything possible to behold our God as he is, and prayer will follow. Right? That's what's so cl- crucial about starting with our Father, knowing who he is and who we are. And then we can come into prayer saying, as Samuel was instructed to Say to God by Eli in 1 Samuel, Speak, Lord, for your servant or son and daughter is listening. We need to know who God is. And then listen and pray, Your will be done, not my will. And what does that look like? You know, Jesus actually shows us exactly what this looks like before he's crucified. In Matthew 26, verses 36 to 46, three times Jesus is praying in the garden. He comes to check on his disciples, and he goes back in anguish about what's, to, what's going to happen, and he prays, yet, not as I will, but as you will. Yet, not as I will, but as you will. He goes back and prays that three times, trusting in the Father, desiring to do the Father's will. And that really brings us to this next piece of prayer that is so crucial. That when we pray, we need to submit our will and our life to God. And that means renouncing things. Kenneth Boa says that without renunciation, so that is saying no to those wants and desires in me that are self-focused or that take me away from God's will. He says, without renunciation, the gifts of God will take the place of God and our relationship with him will consist more of wanting things from him rather than wanting him alone. When we come before God seeking his will, there are things that we need to lay aside. And sometimes I've heard people consistently ask God for something that they want so bad. It's taken the place of God in their lives. And when this happens, we start to justify our position or defend our wants, rather than actually coming to God honestly and seeking what he is calling us to. And sometimes there's even a serious sin that has that has taken God's place, that is preventing us really from hearing from God. Right? There are things that we need to renounce when we come to God in prayer because it really gets in the way of our communion and enjoyment of God. They can be good things. They can be bad things. I remember at one point in my life, I was so, so angry at someone. And I knew that if I sat down to pray, that I would have to forgive this person because God was continually bringing it to mind every time I would go to pray. And so I actually avoided God. I tried to run away because I was so hurt. I was so angry. I felt justified in in my anger. I wanted to hold on to it. And I had to renounce it. 
to, to lay down my pride, my right to be right, and to go before God and forgive that person as I receive forgiveness for my own sin from God. We need to do that. You know, maybe A.W. Tozer's prayer is something for you today. Here's what he prays. He says this, Father, I want to know you, but my coward heart fears to give up its toys. I cannot part with them without inward bleeding, and I do not try to hide from you the terror of the parting. I come trembling, but I do come. Please root from my heart all those things which I have cherished so long, in which I've become a very part of my living self, so that you can enter and dwell there without a rival. That might be the prayer your heart needs right now. And so I encourage you to go before God with that. Prayer renounces that which is not of God, whether it be sin or any idol that gets in the way. And it also becomes unselfish in scope. So the next important thing for us in praying God's will is that we are called to pray for and with one another. Intercession for others is a crucial part of prayer. Uh, We're not to approach prayer just focusing on ourselves. E.M. Bounds says, intercession for others is the hallmark of all true prayer. When prayer is confined to self and to the sphere of one's personal needs, it dies by reason of its littleness, narrowness, and selfishness. Prayer must be broad and unselfish or it will perish. It's a strong word. I think it's important for us to grapple with that as we approach God, that we don't do so for ourselves only. And ultimately, when we come before God and we're taking his word into ourselves, he's calling us to pray for others. He brings those people to mind. We aren't self-focused. It is amazing, too, to think that we are able to meet with God, to have his ear bent towards us, listen to us. And so our souls should, as Bound says, be stirred to plead with God for others. This is really important, to make a habit of unselfishly praying for others. As we meet with God and meditate on his word, that's going to lead us to pray for others in our world, to intercede for others as Christ intercedes for us. And even more, we pray together. And what a joy it is when we enter into community to have others coming alongside to pray. Maybe it's for us. Maybe we're weighed down in our sin or in anguish. And our brothers and sisters gather around and we pray together. And we see in the book of Acts, in Acts 1.14, 2.42, 4.24, and again and again, that believers were coming together in one accord. And they are devoting themselves to praying together. And the Bible says that when one person's sick, call the elders of the church and be prayed for. So we're to gather together to pray. And we pray for God's will to be done together just as we also go and do his will together. Pastor Rush shared that maybe one way for us to begin this as a habit is to pray, to even seek out others to pray this for us. To pray and ask that our heart might long to meet with God. And maybe gather just to pray for just that. That our prayers together would praise God and that we would actually enter into the delight of prayer, which includes but isn't limited to intercession or asking God for things all the time. So let's pray that for one another, that our prayer lives, private and corporately, is alive not merely out of duty, but out of delight, that we would long to be in God's presence together and alone, that we would encourage and pray for one another to grow closer to God. What a great thing to pray for each other. Another very helpful text on prayer is this. In Ephesians 6.18, it says this, And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. It sums up nicely some of the things we've been talking about. But what does it really mean to pray in the Spirit? Right? What is this? I think the best explanation I've heard is that we pray what the Spirit has given us the strength to utter. We want what God wants, not simply what we want. We long to pray in accordance with the will of God, recognizing that we're totally dependent on God, and we come before him in humility, making our request. And then here's an amazing comfort. Paul tells us what the Spirit does for us while we pray. In Romans 8, 
verse 26 to 27, it says, In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. The Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. What an amazing reality. That we come before God open and honest, that we communicate with our Father who we love, who loves us. And we know that our Father knows best what we need. And so we can come in complete trust. Complete trust that He will change and shape us according to His will and that what's prayed by the Spirit will be in accordance with the will of God. Tim Keller puts it well. He says, The Spirit, even when you do not know how to pray, takes your core prayer and prays as you should be praying before the throne. So when you struggle in prayer, you can come before God with the confidence that He's going to give you what you would have asked for if you knew everything He knows. He does care, and he loves you boundlessly. What a comfort to know that when we pray, the Spirit himself, God himself, intercedes for us so that what we have to be praying for is actually heard. So we can be bold to approach the throne of grace in great confidence. We can ask what we want, knowing that even as we seek to pray for God's will, that we can be open and honest and know that God knows best And that what's best is what will be given to us. And that leads me to really a concluding comfort that we have for our prayer. In Hebrews chapter 7, it says this of Jesus. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. And again, in Romans 8, verse 34, Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Wow. God the Father, our Father, seated on his throne, has an open ear, and Christ is interceding on behalf of all who come to God through him. One theologian says that in Jesus' death on the cross, our salvation is, was accomplished, and Jesus' intercession now is the moment-by-moment application of that work. Dane Ortland, author of the book Gentle and Lowly, says, and really let this sink in, that Jesus' deepest desire is to pour out his heart on our behalf before the Father. The intercession of Christ is his heart, connecting our heart to the Father's heart. His heart reaches out to us. It did before, and it still does. John Calvin says that Jesus turns the Father's eyes to his own righteousness to avert his gaze from our sins. He so reconciles the Father's heart to us that by his intercession, he prepares a way and access for us to the Father's throne. What do we do in response? We come to him. That's the only prerequisite for receiving salvation and comfort from Christ. And that's the direction we're called. To come to him. To repent. To turn from chasing other things and to come to God. To give our hearts so wholly over to him. And to allow him to move us. To direct us. So that we might bring others to know him as well. So that we might pray. So that we might share the hope of the gospel with others. Other sufferers and rebels and the lost who need so badly to know the good news of Jesus and to receive what he offers them. To know the free gift of salvation, eternal life that is knowing God. And Jesus lives to make intercession for us. And that's who we pray, that's what we pray, whose name we pray in. We pray in Jesus' name, the one who's interceding for us. For those listening today who know God, who have a relationship with him, Dane Ortland encourages us to do this with the knowledge that we have, to bask in the good news that you are God's children. And, and let that lead you before him in delight. What a privilege. And if you do not know God and, and you haven't yet trusted in Christ, 
I want to encourage you to think about your life, as I mentioned at the beginning. Is it simply heading toward the grave, living as though this world is all there is? What pain it would be to miss the Father's love for you. To know that there's good news, that even now you can know the God who created you and who lived on earth to make a way for you to be right with him. I really pray that God's Holy Spirit would open your eyes to see your need of Jesus Christ and the forgiveness of sin and reconciliation with God the Father that he offers you. Amazing to know that Christ lives to intercede for us. That God is our Father and he is on the throne. And know that prayer changes things. Amen. Let's pray. God, we thank you that we can enter before you, a holy God, that we can boldly approach your throne, that we can come on our knees knowing that you work. I just thank you, God, for this opportunity. I pray that your word would take a deep root in our lives, we would pray it back to you, that we would know you, that we would seek to do your will, knowing that you see all, you care for us too, Lord. That you are our Father. What a, what a joy it is to be able to pray to you, our Father. That you even want to, that you want to have that relationship with us, though we are sinners, we're lost in our sin. You reach down and grab hold of us. Lord, grab hold of our hearts, Lord, so that we might know you. So that we might want nothing but you. So we might long to be in your presence and pray and to intercede for others, to to live out the gospel and to know that you are interceding for us, Lord, is so worthy. So we thank you for your word. We pray all this in your name. Amen. Let's sing one more song together to celebrate.
nothing can stand against the power of our God. Almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows, you win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power. In Ephesians 6, as it says, Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. And it goes through the, the armor of God. It ends with, And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert. And always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Regardless of whether we're at home or wherever we are, we are called to be alert. To be praying people. To pray for others. And that meet with God in prayer. The battle does belong to our God. And we are called to go to our knees in prayer. Presenting all of our requests. Making all prayer and supplication for everything he calls us to. To be constant in prayer. So let's go this week. Constant in prayer. Praying for one another unselfishly. And deepening our faith in God. May we long. May this week you long to be with God. Thank you. Amen.